Yes, hello, and welcome to Release the Creative, your favorite podcast about cognition, creativity, and this week, urban legends. Spooky. Welcome to October. It's a month of Halloween, right? It is. It, well, I mean, amongst other things, but yes. If you want to go uh, all the full the full pagan, it's the Samhain or All, Howls, all Hallows Eve. You want to go the true uh, Judeo-Christian route? Or uh, this year, uh, it's going to be personally, for my family, Easter Halloween, uh, because I don't know what you're doing for trick or treating, but uh, I'm told my kids it's not happening. Oh, yeah. And so the uh, compromise we've made is scavenger hunt at grandma's house, which is basically uh, what you do every Easter Easter egg hunt. So, you know, I guess everybody's got to make their I own. I can get behind that nonsense. Make up their I, own I, new tradition. I like it. Uh, no, I like that. That there's some there's some solid wisdom in there. Uh, no. Urban legends are really cool. Uh, that's what we're talking about this week. Urban legends. The the term was is is written uh, the term as urban legends goes back to as long as 1968. Uh, it is basically the next branch of folklore. Folklore goes back forever. Uh, but, you know, urban legends, we have like the Bunny Man Bridge. We have the, t- the the lover's lane. We have the guy with the kidney in the bathtub full of ice. We you know, there's all these urban. They made a whole series of movies starring Jennifer Morrison before anybody knew who she was uh, <laughs> about these urban legends and where they came from. And it's just it shows that folklore. We, when you think of folklore, you think of, you know, to- tales told around the campfire by primitive peoples. But no, for, uh, urban legends stay to till today yeah they're very uh enticing i love watching fake youtube ghost videos and i know that sounds like kind of a weird I like watching real youtube ghost videos <laughs> I, I don't take the sham stuff it uh, you know it doesn't matter to me uh there's ones i watch that are and clearly fake and uh if it's late at night and you are home alone they they hit the sweet spot of they of do. um they just they they dig inside your brain at this point i feel that just for general background there there are other there's a buzzfeed show and stuff and that's not what this show is but i feel that at this point it should be important to say to the uh, that in the world of skepticism versus belief uh i believe in the supernatural and things that go bump in the night and jeff not so much yeah so for me the difference between the real and the fake ones is uh, production value <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> <laughs> okay like i mean i know that bigfoot is real come at me bro um, I, I know that Bigfoot is real and you like don't uh, haven't accepted the good Lord Bigfoot into yeah, your heart. That is true. <laughs> um, Nessie, not so much, but, you know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but in the in the world of xenobiology and urban legends, they it's such an interesting concept because I can give people the nuclear launch codes, important life saving information, the ability to. You know, the the, the light, the answer to the life, universe and everything, 42. Uh, and they'll forget it because there's no architecture for that. But if I give you a funny, scary, intriguing, spooky story that is any way believable and tell you it's true, it will it will spread like wildfire and even proof to the contrary. People don't tend to believe they're like, oh, no, I my mom told me. Yeah, uh, it's, I, yeah, it's, it's uh, is actually bringing up. I brought I, I brought a. <laughs> I brought a prop today. You brought a prop. Nice. Okay. <laughs> uh, I got an article here from uh, the BBC um, in January 2015. It's by David Robson, if you want to look this up later, okay. uh, viewers. Um, you can tell we're really current in our news. Yeah. No, I, 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 I've i been saving this for five years <laughs> for exactly <laughs> Just this. Just waiting for having a podcast. For this podcast. But no, the whole thing, he's interviewing um, some social scientists who research uh, urban legends and, and yeah. myths and folklores. <laughs> this article is about studying how these stories are evolving in our modern world. Oh, okay. Um, which it, we get into, you're saying they need to appeal to, to deep things within you. Right. But our technology is changing the way we share stories. Um, Absolutely. But not, so not to jump ahead, they start off talking about Slender Man, which. Slender Man's freaking terrifying, man. And I'm not, back to my whole belief thing, I don't, I don't believe in Slender Man, obviously, because that one is so, I mean, that's from a creepypasta website. It's so, <laughs> it's so determinately like, oh, it came from here. Yeah. But just because it isn't real, it's still like, I mean, I can't remember the years and the date. Those two, the two fe- uh, teenage girls that killed their friend in the woods because Slender Man told them to. The article is explaining for those of our, us who don't know who Slender Man is. He's a oh. guy in a suit who is in some way supernatural. He can appear, disappear. Right. He, he stretches like uh, the Fantastic Four. <laughs> yeah, he, he typically is abnormally tall and abnormally thin. He typically either has no face or odd features, uh, both uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer's episode Hush, which won an Emmy. I believe it is season four episode. 
I don't remember. Um, they they were based on Slenderman. They are these these creatures that are silent, as well as if you watch uh, Doctor Who, the silence was based loosely on Slenderman. Yeah. Uh, Slenderman, not by that name, is actually in popular culture of the last 10, 12, 15 years is pretty prevalent of of a man uh, very pale skin, usually abnormally tall, usually abnormally thin and silent and with with expressionless features. Yeah. And it, it came later than uh, the Men in Black, not not just the movie, but I'm saying like the Men in Black theories have gone back to the 1970s. Oh, yeah. Men in Black goes back yeah to the 50s and the 50s. And, and this is kind of a ghostly version of that. Right. No, the Slender Man is the Men in Black have always been a conspiracy theory consisting of a nameless government agency where Slender Man is always the boogeyman incarnate. But he's yeah, he's taking their style, basically. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they, they they shop at the same men's warehouse. Yeah. Um, so this this article goes on to say that uh, a lot of the stories that that get traction in our minds, um, they're supernatural because yeah. that is something that combines the familiar with the bizarre. So the idea sure. of the guys wearing a suit reminds us of authority figures right. or, or government agents. It's the, the cool thing about that from a story and cognition standpoint, again, because this our show is about cognition, is if I told you, hey, Jeff, I was out in the woods yesterday and I saw a lion with eight legs and a scorpion tail, uh, but like full lion head mane, but eight yeah. legs and a scorpion tail. You'd be like, uh huh. <laughs> no, like, you didn't. I was like, no, I seriously, I swear to you, you wouldn't believe me because what I just told you is not rooted or based in anything that you can imagine or understand or would believe it's too far. I've gone too far. But if I came to you as your friend who you've known for 20 years, genuinely shook and I said, hey, I was out in the woods and there was a dude who was probably six foot eight, but he was really skinny and he was wearing this suit and he was just pale and he looked creepy as heck. You could very quickly go, OK, Kirk's obviously upset, but I wonder who was out there. I wonder what the explanation is. I, you that is true enough that it could plant a seed for you. It's close enough to something you can visualize. OK, Kirk saw a creepy tall guy wearing a black suit in the woods. That's. I, I wonder what that's about. Like, but it's not so fanciful, but it, it's bizarre suit, woods, tall, skinny, blank face. Like you can excuse my exaggeration and it plants the seeds of the story. Yeah, that's actually backed up in this study that is they it? did. Cool. Yeah, they, um, I have not read the study, by the way. This is just. Yeah, you're, you're jumping ahead. Sorry. Um, they, they analyzed uh, Grimm's fairy tales. Sure. They, they, they use the theory that the ones that are shared online more often are the more popular ones. So that makes you sense. could accept that as no, yeah, the, the, the ones that promise. have more Google hits are the more popular in society. Right. And so you, using that metric, they found that the more, uh, like you said, weird, supernatural, like the more odd things you put in the story, the less popular yeah. they were. They said the ones that were most popular have one or two outrageous things, but are otherwise grounded in reality. OK. Um, what they says our brains, it seems, only have so much room for the bizarre before it becomes too confusing to enjoy. Right. Uh, and the other example they gave to explain that is think about Little Red Riding Hood. The wolf dressing up as a grandmother is a little bit of a tall tale. But going through the woods to visit your grandmother, packing a picnic, right. encountering a wolf, being afraid of the wolf. They're like most of that story tracks perfectly tracks and perfectly. makes sense. And to that exact same point, you know, the most recent um, the most recent addition to the most recent addition to real uh, uh, folklore and mm. urban legends is the Blair Witch Project. The Blair Witch. First off, there is no Blair, Maryland. It's Blair. It's Bel Air. It's two words. It's not spelled that way. It's 45 minutes from here where they shot it, where they premiered it, everything. The whole thing of them faking the history and faking the reality of it. But even to the point of that movie. Now, I know a lot of the younger kids grew up with paranormal activity. So they're like, oh, Blair Witch, it's blah. And older people never saw it because it was so shaky and it wasn't a good movie. But you and I were 18. That was like aimed laser focused at it, us. It, it had to. Uh... Much like Napoleon Dynamite, you had to be there. <laughs> you really had to understand that you had to be the right age at the right time, which we were. And I will say, you know, in that movie, unlike Paranormal Activity, which came which came later um, with, you know, Eric Blum and, and all that. Blair Witch was brilliant and beautiful, beautiful, because absolutely nothing in that movie is is supernatural. Nothing. There's they find stacks of rocks. They find crosses in the trees they hear screaming in the woods all things that you could they're terrifying they're unknown but they're 
they're cognitive that you could you're like, nope, I, I understand sleeping in the woods and hearing screaming. I, I understand all of those things. And it breaks down to the most terrifying moment is the last frame where she falls down and looks in the corner and the kid is standing in the corner. And you've heard throughout the movie that the Blair Witch made children stand in the corner while they ki- she killed the other children. But there's nothing supernatural in that movie. It makes you do everything in your head which is the scariest place to be for anyone, not just me. Yeah, they are in this article are talking about how the Bloody Mary myth, which is you uh, don't mess around with Bloody Mary. Don't you, do it. Yeah, you, you encant her name into a mirror and a face will appear before you. They said that's one that has survived over the years and remained popular because it's so simple, simple. and straightforward and everyone has a mirror. <laughs> Did you know that if you say pumpkin spice latte three times in a mirror, a, a woman in yoga pants will show up and tell you all the things she loves about fall? <laughs> has it worked for you yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> Keep trying. <laughs> but um, no, it's it's that one was told to me at such a I, I am 38 years old. That one was told to me when I was 12. And I will tell you right now, I have never tried it because it scared me so much all the way through the time that I stopped believing in it that by the time like I I I was told at 12 you do this and I was so terrified by it. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. Like, <laughs> no, why? No, um, just, just don't <laughs> just. OK, it's like saying Beetlejuice three times. Gotcha. You've given me the thing to not do. Uh, yeah, I've been a, a, a firm believer in the things that go bump in the night my whole life. Yeah. Yeah. So. So interestingly, in terms of cognition, they said that what they kind of identified two ways that a story can become memorable. One is involving a social connection. Sure. Um, and the true. other is kind of to uh, play on your survival instincts so something to do with death or dying. Right. And so they said, obviously, the stories that incorporate both. Right. Tend to, they did. They. they gave a bunch of these urban legends to people and then told them to share them with other people in the study and like which ones did they remember the most later and they said you know combining the two um really helps so like for example for one that didn't involve a social connection but uh just played on your fear of death is a woman who had poisonous spiders make a nest in her in her wig and then they killed her and they're like that was the day of a popular story but then later failed to be memorable right um because it didn't have that it was just kind of a one-off oh yeah she, she died not as many people wear wigs not as many people yeah there's there's yeah and then the uh, conversely was not to deal with death but there's apparently I, i've not come across this one a story about a woman who like goes on a dating site and uh like has sex with a man that she doesn't know and then later turns out it was her her father in disguise and they're like that that has like a strong who the hell would tell that story that's uh, awful the internet <laughs> that's, you know what i don't know why i uh, that, yes the answer is always the, the internet. Al- always the always so internet. that's one with a high social connection but not much so these are both right. examples of like extremes to the left or right and they said they they are titillating in the moment but don't they don't travel very far. They don't I get like it. retold a so lot. So the other thing that that is maybe not missing, but not emphasizing, at least again, I haven't read it, um, is is we saw this a lot in the 80s horror movie tropes that they covered in in the Wes Craven uh, Scream series, which was all about the the playing on these tropes. So urban legends play a lot, play a lot, play off a lot of the same tropes psychologically and cognitively as those as those old horror movies is, which is to say they're rooted in social proof and whether or not they said it or not, things like the person that goes off by themselves will die, mm-hmm. period. Yeah. The woman that has sex maybe won't die, but she will be attacked. Like the to to break off from the norm, to do drugs, to dr- stand, that, stand out in some way. If, if you stand out from the group, you um, and that's why these urban legends are like take the, the kidney, uh, the, the guy with the ice and Everyone has heard the one like I went. He went to a bar and he this woman bought him a drink and she he took the drink and then he woke up in a seedy motel bathroom full of ice and he didn't have a kidney. Um, and and you're like that's never happened, has it? <laughs> because everyone's I say everyone I have not for the record, because going to a bar and meeting a strange woman who uh, pays attention to you and buys you a drink and those are so ultimately believable. Like, even if it hasn't happened to you, you're like, I can imagine a woman finding me interesting. Well, these uh, stories all play off of it's a real world thing, not stories. But when somebody has, when a tragedy befalls someone. Sure. A lot of human beings love to try to latch on to how it's their fault. 
Oh, interesting. Because if, okay. if there's a story of someone getting raped, well, how was she dressing? Was she drinking too much? If someone gets murdered, well, were they, were they dealing drugs? Were they right. hanging how out with the it, wrong people? How is it? How am I exempt? So from, yes. How, the, how, yeah. how is my behavior protect me from that terrible thing? So in the in the world of fallacies, that's either called uh, it's either called the Texas sharpshooter or the move the goalpost. It's it's like this girl who was doing everything right had something happen to her. How was her behavior uh, an aberrant or or different than mine? How am I safe? Yeah, because how, if how, it was random, that's terrifying. If, if it was random, that's terrifying. If it was uh, if it was something that we both did, that's worse. But if it was their fault, then then I feel safer. And that's th- what you were describing. These movies are sort of backing up that mindset sure sure like but and folklore in general all the way up to when they became urban legends one of the biggest things of urban legends tends to be this element of social proof which is to say it's the boy who cried wolf it's it's little red riding hood it's they're, don't their lessons yeah. their lessons now i want to take a twist that i don't know if is in there this one was really fun and and by fun i mean not fun at all so in 2016, I'm sure you remember, there was the clown scare. All right. over the country, there was these clowns, and there's all these <laughs> vicious attacks. It the, made real news. The great clown scare of 2016. Yes. The great clown, so much so that they sent home a letter from my daughter's school, who was second grade, and they sent letters that any jokes about clowns, mentioning clowns, would be seen as a threat and not, not to mention clowns wow. or... Um, it got it was this it was this panic about clowns and and like i said my my daughter's school sent a letter home saying these jokes aren't tolerated yeah. don't talk to your child about it because starting in green bay wisconsin and then up in the pacific northwest and all all these clowns were coming out of the woods and i talked to several of my friends here's the thing none of it actually happened right <laughs> it was it was like the blair witch project very much like the blair witch project it was uh, people doing a short film that were planting these things, planting these stories so that they could do a pseudo documentary about the rumor spreading. But it just like H.G. Well, not H.G. Wells, sorry, Orson Welles, yeah. War of the Worlds. It it crossed over from fantasy to reality for people and they couldn't they couldn't separate the pieces. Uh, and as such, uh, the, the Great Clowns Guy of 2016, that was a big deal that was a complete hoax. Yeah, that gets back to the one one element of that was a little weird, but it being so grounded in reality made yeah. it more believable. Everyone had seen a clown. It had already made clowns terrifying. That's actually a, a good and we need to take a break in a second. But before we do that, um, this is a this is a good lesson for your own storytelling. Um, this is one of the primary reasons that movies like Ghostbusters had such appeal. Mm -hmm. The original, original Dan Aykroyd idea for Ghostbusters was like far in the future. Ghostbusters were like garbage men. And like there was just guys everywhere that that trapped ghosts for you. And And if I remember, weren't they wizards with wands? Weren't they? It was was, more supernatural. It was very normal, though. It was supposed to be like in the the distant future. And uh, I don't know if it was budgetary reasons or the record I watched that movie or someone talked him out of it. But the reason Ghostbusters is has such a, a, a appeal to a lot of people is it starts so real disgraced professors they're, they're, yeah. they're college professors they lose their jobs they're worried about their mortgage they go to the bank they get a loan they mess with uh, electronics with a soldering iron and the it's all like very homemade looking stuff and so the jump from I, I'm a college professor in New York, too. I'm trapping ghosts is made to seem like a very minuscule right. jump. <laughs> right. And ghosts are real. I don't care what you say. So people <laughs> just get that. It's something that people understand. No. So, yeah, let's take a break and, and we'll come back and we'll talk a little more. All right. We'll be right back. Hey, Jeff and I wanted to take a minute just here at the top of the show to say thank you for joining us on our new podcast and YouTube show, Release the Creative. Whether you're new to our brand of crazy or you followed us over from one of our other social media platforms, LinkedIn, Twitch, Facebook, or Twitter, we'd like to thank you for joining us here. Please take this moment to hit the subscribe and the like button and also that funny little notification button so that you can be uh, notified of all our new episodes. We're really trying to get this new show up on the road. Thank you so much for watching.
And we're back from our break. So we're talking urban legends. Yep. And uh, we said before the break that some urban legends appeal to your fear of death or bodily harm, and sure. some appeal to sort of a social connection and the sweet spots in the middle. Sure. This uh, article here, though, kind of wraps up by saying Slender Man is an odd exception to that rule. It's got legs. It is a story that has lasted a long time. It doesn't have a lot of social component in its stories. It's, it's generally just someone encountering Slender Man and being uh, attacked or terrified in some way. Uh, and so what the, the article says here is that one possibility here is that Slender Man is just a fluke, an exception that proves the rule. More intriguing, however, is the idea that it instead reflects a deeper change in the way that we craft folktales thanks to the internet. So they point out Social stories may be more memorable, but they weren't necessarily more enjoyable, according to the participants. In other words, as more stories are shared on the internet, our stories may lose some of their social nuances and become more ghoulish. So the idea is when we used to tell stories face to face, the sort of social connection, like when you're talking to it, when you're telling a story, that mattered. But now we're just click share, click share, and you're reading it on 4chan at 3 a.m. in the morning by yourself. I've uh, never been on 4chan at 3 a.m. I'm just going to say that <laughs> right now. It's more of a lunchtime activity. <laughs> uh, but the idea is that we, when we're sharing on the internet, we don't have that social connection. And so when, since we're not experiencing it in real time, That's interesting. the sharing, the, the more ghoulish nature becomes what matters more. And something just sort of having a, a shock like, because basically in the past, sharing a story meant you remembered it. You carried it with you. You thought about it. Next time it came up in conversation, you retold the story. What does sharing mean now? Click. In, in that split second, do I click share or do I click next? Right. And so the- Do I swipe or do I- The criteria for sharing is an entirely different thing. Uh, so it's, a, it's certainly feasible to say that storytelling in the digital age may evolve in a different way than fairy tales of the past, which were shaped by the cognitive constraints of oral transmission. So their 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 thesis here is that the way we share information is changing the kinds of stories we find appealing. So this is all hitting me right now. I've no, this yeah, is, I, I intentionally didn't tell you any of this. No, before. <laughs> I, he very intentionally didn't. I, so this is all very live reaction without reading more of the, the nuanced connective tissues. I, I either really, really agree, but didn't understand or super disagree with their thesis. And, and that's by this. If I were to, without spending too much time, if I were to ask you as a child under 12 years old, where do monsters live? Under the bed. And? In the closet. There you go. Yeah. Which means that we have a deep, oh, sorry, and you're, uh, and, and what is the other thing that all children, my children weren't allowed to have one, but what is the other thing that, that children need uh, in their room at night? Uh, a glass of water? Night, nightlight. Oh, nightlight. Like, okay. They're afraid of the dark. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Under yeah. the bed, in the closet, afraid of the dark. Why? We have a, if you listen to Doctor Who, it's because of the Nasha Ferrata. But in every other circumstance here, um, it's because we have a deep rooted psychological cognitive fear of things that we know about, but don't know about. Mm -hmm. Like we know what a bed is and we know where the bed is and we know what under, we know what's under the bed, but we don't know what's under the bed right now. Right now. Yeah. We know what's in the closet, but we can't see in the closet right now. We... This is our room. It's it's colored blue and there's bunnies on the wall and my favorite stuffed animals over there. But it's dark. Is my stuffed animal still over there? We are we are terrified. It just from a from a species level of the thing that we understand, but don't understand. So for me, the social construct of I don't know a human being that doesn't have at least one story of the creepy man that was looking at me funny from the bus stop or this one time I was on. I was this one time that I was insert place. There was this one almost always guy, but sometimes it's a crazy old lady. Um, there was this one guy and he was just staring at me and it gave me the chills. Slender Man to me is is inherently socially constructed because it plays on that common story that every human being, at least in Western culture, I haven't talked to many. Eastern or Middle Eastern people about this, yeah. but that every East a Westerner that I've ever talked to under the bed, in the closet, in the dark, we all have that story of the of the, the dude that gave us the creeps. Yeah, well, no, I'll tell you that my two big fears as a child, um, I had a, a bunk bed that was made of slats of wood uh -huh. and right by my pillow, uh, there was a knot on the wood that resembled kind of a Dr. Seuss character almost. It was swirly okay. and it was like a, a face with an eye on the side and like a little pointy head, like some kind of animal. Sure. And the fact that this knot 
could watch me while I sleep creeped me the fuck out <laughs> and to the point where I taped a piece of paper over it for like six years of my life from like age six to twelve I had a little piece of paper taped over this piece of the bed because I could not stand I have no problem believing that that's that about face. you just I mean in general yeah. and and my my that's like the other fear I had uh would be and it was based on age it depended on what it was sure something watching me through the window for a right. lot of my childhood it was an alien other times it was you know a, a, a person um but the idea that like i would wake up and look at the window and see someone watching me was like the great fear do you, do you remember this was the, probably the biggest fear i had in a movie theater ever in m Knight's signs mm -hmm. and he's reading his daughter the story mm -hmm. and he like kind of mel what's mel gibson right he kind of mm -hmm like looks to the side and he stands up and looks out the window and the alien is on the roof watching him sure that three seconds when did that movie come out i was like uh, teenager to 20 uh, yeah I was, I was like 20 years old those three seconds brought back 15 years of childhood fears <laughs> no <laughs> instantly so i um a majority of my life i'm always more comfortable on a couch than a bed it's just a weird thing about me so uh as a kid i would sleep on the bed on the couch in the basement and we had a walkout basement and we had one of those doors that's made of like nine panes of glass right. like like it's a glass door but a Tic -tic -tac -toe board. <laughs> like a tic-tac-toe board right a big and uh I would be watching TV, and so the TV is across from me, and the 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 same thing. The um, the the door was on that same wall, but kind of in my periphery. And any wind moving a thing, any movement would catch my which. Yeah, way. And we're talking. I'm not talking 12 years old. I'm talking 15, 16, 17, 18. Yeah. And like, then it became aware uh, apparent to people that I'm an insomniac and always up. So all my high school friends would like sneak out of their house and come hit me up at mine and I'd be watching TV. So the number of times that suddenly I'd look over and there'd be like Brian, if you remember Brian, be like <laughs> looking at the window and it would send me into cardiac arrest. My point in all this is Brian is 6'6 six, six and weighs like 140 slender man. Yeah. Um, them saying that it's not a social construct confuses me because either I don't understand what they mean or I think so. I would have to go back through this article to be sure. I think you're misunderstanding what they mean by social construct. Okay, and I believe that. You're 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 saying the fear comes between the social construct between you and the monster that it's it's exploiting your fears of other humans. Right. You're saying the social proof of the leaving the group or what, the what they mean by social construct is that the 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 fear the thing somehow affects your okay. tribe. No, so in that okay. sense, Jaws the shark eating your friend is what they mean by social construct okay. is my friend has been killed that is scary to me no 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 i get that so that's a different so then i will then then with that piece of information let me double down and and explain my my thing is that i don't think it's either i don't think it's the exception that proves the rule i think it's a misunderstanding of the rule mm -hmm. and and that is to say this that that i mean I again not to be like I wrote a book about sociology and and the social construct of of feeling left out from the group and and how that is probably one of our most primal fears because evolutionarily being without the group be, being without the group is probably one of the most single terrifying things yeah case case in point just to interrupt here yeah. I was reading recently there was a uh, some anthropologist was asked recently, what is the earliest signs of human civilization? Was it like uh, arrowheads or or cave paintings? Sure. Like what, what, what's the oldest example we have of society? Yeah. And she said it is older than both of those. It is burial graves they found with healed bones, humans with yeah. limbs that were broken and then healed. Is that that does not happen in the animal kingdom? You right. are hurt. You, you die. You die. And the, often it was your tribe that killed you. Yeah. You're now a blight on the society. Yeah. But if your leg healed and you continue living, that mean, meant someone cared for you. Someone cared for you. And they said that that goes back way further than cave paintings. No. And that's thank you. That's awesome. Um, so the whole concept is, is that we, whether you're an introvert, extrovert, love people, hate people. <laughs> the true fact of the matter, with the exception of the the hermits in the woods, truly being an outcast, social or otherwise, is a true, truly deep ingrained fear. Take that to the next level. Take that one step further. OK, so now I'm alone. Being alone doesn't kill you. Being having something you don't understand in the dark that kill like mm -hmm. the. Uh, so it's it's not that this is the exception that proves the rule. It's that this is one. This is Dante's Inferno one step deeper. This is they're saying that this lacks the social construct. Right. Because this is one. This is pr that is societal feel. This is primal fear. This is. There is something I can't control 
It's standing over there. I don't understand it. It's in the dark. It's I have no control of it and I have no tribe to protect me. This is already lost the tribe. It's all Slender Man is always alone. You're always already separated. It's it's what happens after you say, hey, guys, I'll be right back and wanted to go pee behind a tree. That's when the boogeyman gets you. This is the boogeyman. This is already it's not that it's the exception that proves the rule. It's that this is the rule beyond the, the situation. Yeah. If that made sense at all. I think so. I also want to stress that we are reading an article about a scientific study, which is always a recipe for uh, misunderstanding. <laughs> no, for the record, I'm going to go find the scientific study because like this yeah, is for, fascinating for our, our viewers here. If you want to look this up, the article, if you search uh, BBC.com, David Robson as the author. From, I just said, does it go into Robson? It's by Robson. Yeah, by David Robson. Yeah, okay. no, he, he invented urban. He, he coined the term urban legend. Well, there we go. So he's writing about it. Uh, yeah, he, he was one of the first people in 1968. Interesting. So we, we found a, I mean, it's a great article is why I brought it. Awesome. In no. today. Yeah. At the very so, beginning, I was like, hey, did it go into does it go into Robson? I, it's by him. Yeah. So awesome. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would suggest you look that up. And, and or uh, my book, The Very Best Bad Idea. It's, it talks about this stuff, too. Yeah. Not urban legends, but, you know, you know you're, you know, David Robson, though. <laughs> That's true. I'm not. <laughs> but uh, so he was a professor at the University of Michigan, I think. So I guess, though, the uh, the the two quick takeaways for our viewers uh, if you're crafting your own message right um, in some ways keep it simple uh, you know fantastical ideas are are great I've I've told you my favorite movies are all of the ones that are a slight tweak off the real world I love Back to the Future, Men in Black, sure. Ghostbusters, Indiana Jones, way more than Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, right. Star Wars. Well, because yeah. they're they're just one small step removed. And and to the same thing with me. So I've I, you know I got in playing D and D and other things and reading. And again, I like Harry Potter as much as the next guy, and I like playing D and D as much as the next guy uh, that has no life and is a nerd and is me. So that wasn't an insult to people that like those things. <laughs> um, but. I like urban fantasy far more because mm -hmm. it roots it in something I understand. It's I like Harry Dresden, your your local wizard, far more than than Harry Potter, because Harry Potter goes into goes behind the veil into this world that muggles don't see or understand. Harry Dresden has a, a yellow pages ad wizard like and I find that so much more reachable. And, Which, uh, you know, obviously Harry Potter found great success, but these lessons are for our viewers in your own life. Uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I'm not filming filming a trillion dollar movie mm. <laughs> anytime soon. No. So the uh, keep it keep it simple sometimes. No, uh, and, and again, if, if you're telling a story, be it about your brand or you're writing a novel or whatever, um, it has to be rooted into something people can understand. And if you're going to go hard fantasy, you have to build a world that is consistent. When you start building a world that has no consistency or isn't something people can wrap their head around, it isn't something that attaches to that cognitive architecture. The most terrifying things are things that you can believe. If someone came to me, if my daughter came to me and said, my a kid at school pulled out a, a grenade, I'd be like, uh, really? probably a toy. But if he came and said he pulled out a pocket knife, I'd be like, we probably need to call the school. That probably happened. Yeah. So it's the most terrifying things are the things that you can that, that you can imagine. So good lessons and uh, also goodbye. Happy this, Halloween coming up. Yeah. yeah, this is Release the Creative. If you're watching us on YouTube, you should subscribe to the podcast. If you are listening to this on the podcast, you should check us out on YouTube. Yeah, no, we're fun. So those are all awesome. the options. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining us here at Release the Creative. Kirk here would never say it to your face, but he thinks you should like and subscribe to us on YouTube. And Jeff is far too shy to admit it, but he thinks you should subscribe to us on your favorite podcast reader. Yeah, well, you're the one who's always saying that everyone should give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Why do you have to make everything so difficult? <laughs> <laughs>